FNAF lore. It's confusing, complicated, and most importantly, it's unsolved. But I want to take time and focus on the unsolved part. Again. So, hello everyone. Welcome back to another FNAF Unsolved Mysteries video. I made one of these, uh, a, a while ago. I, I kind of forgot about it, not gonna lie. I'll be tackling four mysteries this time around, and make sure you stay to the end of the video, because we're talking about the biggest mystery at the end. So, let's go ahead and just get started with the first mystery. Here we go. So the first mystery I'm going to talk about here is Old Man Consequences, the weird little alligator man that just keeps fishing. He only appears in two games. He first appeared in FNAF World when you go down all four glitch sub-levels. Once going down the last level, you appear at a lake surrounded by forest and you can see an alligator person thing fishing at a lake. Once approaching him, he will say this. Sorry to say you've gone too deep into the code, there is no way back out. My name is Old Man Consequences, come have a seat and let's fish for a while. You have nowhere else to go. And that would award you with his trophy. He then appears again in UCN, yeah. They got all my consequences, but not fun time Freddy. To get his trick, you have to put only him on and set him just to one difficulty. Then simply just catch the fish, and then this will happen. Still not really sure why. You would then be teleported to the same place as in FNAF World. Instead of it being quiet, you can hear distant screams and make out a few words. <laughs> And we're led to believe that that is William Afton essentially burning in hell, asking both Henry and Mike to help him. And we all know they're not going to do that. When talking to Omen Consequences, he says the following text. Come and sit with me a while. Leave the demon to his demons. Rest your own soul. There is nothing else. So yeah, very, very interesting. Also, while editing this video, I completely forgot that you can actually drown in both of the lakes and different things will happen in each game. So for UCN, you can drown and once fully submerged in a lake, it will just crash your game. And that's it. But for FNAF World, if you drown yourself instead of talking to Omen Consequences, you are met with this screen, which is the same one from UCN. But wait, there's way more to this. After waiting on this screen for a very long time, this little image pops up. What does it mean? I have no idea. I think it's supposed to represent Happy's Day, but there isn't much evidence to go off here. So let me know what you guys think of this, because I honestly, I couldn't find much on this. I, I don't know. So I did some research on who Old Man Consequences is, and I found three main theories from other people. First one is that he's Henry. Second one is that he's Michael. And third one is that he's some sort of like supernatural being, like kind of like the devil, kind of. And if you want my honest opinion, I believe it's kind of like the third one. Let me explain. Basically, my take on it is that it's more of like a metaphor for Cassidy stop torching after. All the yelling in the back of the room saying, help me, what more could Cassidy Cassidy won. William is at a point where he's dealing with every creation and every face he's ever seen in a basically fully customized hell that was made perfectly for him. The line of leave the demons to his demons, rest your own soul, there is nothing else, should be enough proof on its own to finally leave Afton where he belongs and rest your own soul. I really like what this reddit user said here where they don't think Old Man Consequences is like a specific person in the lore, but rather a moral figure to tell Cassidy to stop and finally rest your soul. I really like the use of the words moral figure, I find it very fitting for Old Man Consequences. Obviously I can 100% be wrong here, but that's just my opinion, so let me know what you guys think about that. And now let's get an opinion from a member, and if you want to be featured in one of my videos, make sure to become a member, and you might just be picked to be in an upcoming video. So what is your opinion on Old Man Consequences? All right, so my opinion on Old Man Consequences is um, basically it's it, we already know that's a mini game in FNAF World and in um, Ultimate Custom Night, and we get the quote: "Leaves the demon to his uh, demons. There's nothing more. Rest your own soul." That one, it, it's kind of like confusing because it's like, does it mean rest? Like, like whose soul is gonna be resting? Is it gonna be Golden <laughs> Freddy or like who? are we talking about here so yeah that's a that's a pretty good question uh i really like the idea of old man consequences i find it pretty mysterious that uh when we go into the river uh we we drown and then yeah your game crashes not much else i can really think of okay is there anything else you want to add uh, i think that's it all right well thank you so much for coming on i really appreciate it man uh yeah uh, thank you for uh, so much for your time floop i hope you have a good day yep you too all right and with that being said let's go ahead and move on to the next mystery Alright, so the next mystery I'm going to talk about is the FNAF 4 box. I'm sure all of you know what this is by now, but if you don't, I'll make a brief explanation. Basically, once beating Nightmare Mode in FNAF 4, you are worried with, well, this box. You can see that it's locked to two locks, and they kind of jiggle around a little bit. After sitting here for a bit, text will appear above the box, saying, Perhaps some things are best left forgotten. 
for now. And then it just fades to black. And yeah, that's like basically it. So yeah, after almost 10 years, almost a full decade, we still don't have a confirmed answer for what's actually inside the box. Obviously, there's been countless theories about what could be inside. The most common answer that I'm seeing, and it was also mentioned in Daco's interview with Scott Cawthon, is that the box, it represents the unanswered nature of the story, basically. The idea is that opening the box would represent the pieces being put together or the main story being solved. I found that sentence on a post on Reddit, so it will be credited in the description below if you want to check it out. But will we ever see the box open? I honestly don't know. I know it says it's some things I've forgotten for now, but it's been a decade, like, I don't know anymore. Scott did also confirm in an interview that MadPat was right in saying that the contents of the box have indeed changed, meaning that whatever was in the box originally is no longer in the box. You obviously might have heard other theories of the box, such as it's crying child's body, or like little toys, or maybe in cis location animatronic parts. I'm pretty confident that we will basically never know what's inside the box. I don't know if it will be opened. But my take on it, it's pretty much the same. I see that the box definitely represents like the mystery of the series, seeing the content of the box would solve everything immediately. But with those objects, are, I seriously don't have a good idea. And I think I'm gonna need some expert help on this one. Hi, I'm Johnny the Night Guard. Not sure if Floop introduced me or not, but either way, I'm happy to be here. I'm here to give my take on the infamous FNAF 4 box. Except it isn't really my take. It's from the incredible 9 hour FNAF lore speedrun by Gibby's Good Idea Bad Idea. I'm not trying to be unoriginal, I just can't give an original take because I genuinely believe this one is the correct one. So what's in the box? It's the pieces put together, as Scott said. One of his main goals with FNAF 4 was to answer everyone's favorite question to ask about the FNAF games. Why on earth would the Night Guard come back for another 4-6 to six nights? FNAF 4 is Michael's origin story told from the point of view of the crying child. The main point of FNAF 4's story is to show us that this whole game franchise is very focused on the Afton family and that Michael is the protagonist of all the previous games and he's on a mission. The mentions of odor and tampering with animatronics on the pink slip are more than just jokes. They're mainly here to show us that the same guy is night guarding in each game. People didn't get the hint from the fourth game though, so Scott finally decided to just tell us the answer in the sister location cutscene. So back to the question, what's in the box? I know I'm, I'm kind of stalling. The box would have a few items that confirm the family focused story. Gibby's video claims that it would likely be the Fredbear plush, a photo of Michael's family, with them being named the Schmitz because this was before the Afton family name was coined, and this idea is supported by Mike actually being named Schmidt in the movie, and the third item would be a box of matches. The matches would prove that Michael was the FNAF 3 night guard, the family picture would prove that he was Foxy Bro, and the Fredbear plush would confirm that Golden Freddy was at least partially possessed by Crying Child, and confirm that Michael was the night guard in FNAF 1 as well because Golden Freddy says it's me to him, like he knows him from the past. I'm not saying I'm 100% sure it would be these items exactly, but the exact things in the box aren't what's important, it's what they say about the story. The main point of this interpretation is that the box would contain memorabilia that proves that Foxy Bro is related to the killer and the soul possessing Golden Freddy, which perfectly explains why he would take the night guard job and spend 15 nights at Freddy's. Holy, yeah, I can't even say I've ever thought of any of that actually being like a possibility. You brought up a lot of good points that probably keep me awake at night just thinking about them. So yeah, special thanks to Johnny and Nightguard for helping me on this video, but now let's go ahead and talk about the next mystery. <laughs> Next up is just Miss Afton as a whole. We know basically nothing about her. I feel like we should. I feel like we should really have a big part in lore. Maybe not as big as building the whole pizza flex like MatPat's timeline suggests, but I do think it could be important. There's a lot of theories that Miss Afton is in Ballora, but there isn't confirmed evidence for it. You might also see people refer to Miss Afton as Clara because that's the name of this person in the Immortal and the Restless show. There's also this little group of staff files representing the Afton family with Miss Afton obviously included. And I think it's pretty accurate. The fact that this one's missing head, this one being baby, which we know is Elizabeth Afton, and these two just being like, I don't know, like kind of like business and like work. Workers. I think this one has to be Miss Afton. I will say it does kinda, just kinda resemble Ballora here. I don't know for sure. And there's even deleted lines of those staff thoughts which read as follow. I am home. You are home early. I quit my job. What about the children? We have a down payment on a new closet. I do not know what I was thinking. I was compelled to leave my post. This is no longer working. I am leaving. Do not go. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. Not sure why this got cut, it would've given an actual response to what happened to Miss Afton, and it gave a reason on why she would leave. But since it got cut, I don't really know if this is like a canon response anymore. But going back to Ballora's Miss Afton, or at least Ballora's like a representation of her, some evidence to go with it is just straight up what Ballora says. These 
lines indicate that Miss Absent is constantly feeling alone and there is no joy in her life. Also, that first line, why do you hide behind your walls, seems like she's talking to William for all his wrongdoing. My take on Miss Afton is that she left once Elizabeth died. The death of her youngest son and then her daughter was just too much to handle, so she ended up leaving. Yet again, in my opinion, I don't think she built the pizza plex like MatPat stated because why would she build something that reminds her of the franchise and the person that killed off her kids? It just, like, doesn't really add up to me, like, but yeah, that's just my take on Miss Afton. Now, let's get a viewer opinion yet again. So, what's your opinion on Miss Afton? So, um, Miss, I, I, like, as a character, she's pretty cool. Um, she definitely shows the wrong, the wrong spouse, you know, a murder child guy. But, like, you know, I think him turning her into Ballora and, like, this whole backstory on her is pretty cool. So, you think she's, uh, so you think she's Ballora? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> is that all you have to say? Uh, I think so, yeah. Alright, <laughs> thank you. Alright, let's go ahead and move on to the final mystery of this video. So yeah, the final mystery we're going to talk about is indeed Midnight Motors. I would argue that this is one of FNAF's biggest mysteries. Not everyone agrees with what happens, and some people, me included, just straight up don't understand it. So quick recap of Midnight Motors. To get it, you have to take this exit in the Midnight Motors arcade machine, and you are met with this screen driving your car in a foresty location. Your first stop is right here on the left in the middle of the forest, and you can park and get out. Once you get out, you're led to an open area with a pile of dirt. This is presumed to be a grave, but we'll touch back on this later. Now going back and following the path, you see a spot to turn left here. Turning left will lead you to juniors where it lets you park and get off the car yet again you can walk up to this green guy which says all this following text which i'm not going to read just for right now you're going to get back in your car and keep going forward which will lead you to this random house yet again again you're able to get out of the car approach the house where it then zooms in on you after walking in you see someone's watching tv and sitting on the couch and they're just kind of in the minding their own business there they didn't really do anything you can't talk to them and yet again i'll get to these lines later if you keep walking forward you find yourself in front of the door it is locked and you can try knocking on it which leads to the following lines So you go all the way around the house to find a broken window, animatronic footprints, and human footprints with the following line of dialogue. And finally, it fades to black. So what to make out of this? <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> like there's so much to talk about here, so let's just go down the list here. So first, who is Mustard Man? I want to say William, and I would say that the rest of the community pretty much agrees on this. I don't think it's Cassidy's parents, like the parent of a missing child. I feel like that's just like a really random thing to do, but I don't really have solid evidence against this, so I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just Personally, it's not what I believe, which is 100% okay. If you think th if you think that's the case, that's totally fine. So the when does it take place question goes back to my first point because I believe this takes place right after William finished killing Charlie. I say this because the files of the minigame is titled as Later That Night, as it's raining pretty much exactly the same way as it was during Charlie's death minigame. So I would say that adds up perfectly. Next is Juniors. I think Juniors is like one of two things. Either it's a bar or it's just some random place. I don't think it makes sense to be like a FNAF location because why would William not be allowed to go in there? Isn't he like the current owner of Freddy's locations, that wouldn't make any sense. For who's sitting on the couch, there's really only two answers you can say here. It's either Michael Afton or Miss Afton. I believe that it's personally Miss Afton, because if it was Michael, then that means the person in the room would have to be crying child, which doesn't make sense for Michael to say this, since he has been nothing but a bully to his brother. And yes, I know that older brothers tend to change up, and they do really like care for their siblings, but Michael was like the worst person ever. He went way too far with everything. He should have at least comforted crying child a little bit when he knew crying child was that scared of everything. And I believe that crying child is actually dead at this point but I'll come back to this later. And I've heard that in the files that this person's name is actually Man Sitting, but I literally cannot find proof of that anywhere. And after doing like solid research, it's apparently referred to as Backdrop 26. Man Sitting was never a real thing, so I personally think it's Miss Afton. Now for who's locked in the room, it's gonna have to be Michael for me. Realistically, like only a teenager is capable of breaking a window and escaping, Plus, it's just common for teenagers to sneak out like this. A crying child would have to be like 7 at a time, he's not gonna break a window and leave like that. The reason why he's sneaking out is mentioned in my last point, which is, whose grave was that? Now this is where things will probably get controversial. I believe that we see footsteps out here because that's Golden Freddy standing here. We've seen Golden Freddy stand up in the movie and in FNAF AR, which I know technically aren't canon, but there are parallels in both of them. Now I believe that we see Golden Freddy stand here because this is the grave of crying child. So crying child comes back to the house as Golden Freddy to tell Michael to basically like follow me or it's me kind of thing. Once following golden freddy it will lead to the grave and that is where i believe michael is seeking out to go obviously this is all speculation and, all, and it is all my opinion so definitely let me know what you guys think midnight murders has been unsolved mystery for a while now so i definitely want to talk about it here and to end this mystery off let's get an opinion from yet again another viewer so me and floops have similar thoughts on this theory and he does bring up some pretty good points 
but I do have some different thoughts on this. I made a video on this earlier and I'm only now realizing that I didn't do a good job at explaining things, and I also left a lot of untied thoughts in my analysis video, so I'll be closing up those loose ends, and I'll also be doing a better job at explaining things. So without further ado, let's just jump straight into it. The first thing I want to talk about is who is this person we play as in Midnight Motorist? And who is his family? I agree with Floops on this, I also believe that we're playing as William, but you guys might be saying the man we play as is yellow, not purple. Well I actually have a plausible idea on why William is yellow and not purple. Throughout the franchise, William is depicted as either purple or yellow depending on the context. But the question is, when are these colors applied and why? When William is depicted as purple, he is showing his violent and vindictive side while enjoying it. William is this color during the missing children incident, this is the color he's in during the dead child incident, and this is the color he's in when he's taking apart the FNAF 1 animatronics. Purple is only a representation of William. This color is only used to depict his evil acts. That is why when Charlie is alone and give kick to the children, William is seen as purple while killing her. William Afton might be a purple killer deep down, but when he faces the rest of the world, he's yellow. That is why he's seen as yellow when he's with other people. But what about the person on the couch? And who was it that ran off? Well I believe it's Michael who ran off and not the crying child. I also think it's William's wife who was on the couch because she is the only person left in the Afton family apart from Michael. The reason I think this is because both the crying child and Elizabeth are dead at this point. Elizabeth died from Circus Baby. Then the crying child died during the bite of 83 in FNAF 4 shortly after. But who was it that lured Michael out? Well I believe it's the crying child who lures him out as Golden Freddy or Fredbear, since both animatronics have three toes on their feet. And this matches the three toe footprint next to the bushes. But I believe the crying child used the likeness of Fredbear to lure Michael out. Since Michael has seen Fredbear, but he hasn't seen Golden Freddy at this point in time. And Michael would have more of a connection to Fredbear over Golden Freddy, because Fredbear is the animatronic that killed his younger brother. Plus Cassidy is the person who possesses Golden Freddy, and we know that Michael feels regret after his brother's passing. Michael says this at the end of FNAF 4. He says he's sorry to the crying child when he's in the coma, so Michael would follow the spirit of the crying child to his burial site in the woods. And speaking of a burial site, this leads me to my next point. Floops already went over this and my thoughts are pretty much the same, but I'll do a brief rundown of the mound of dirt we see in the forest next to Junior's. Like Floops, I believe the mound of dirt is the crying child's grave. Now I believe the crying child didn't die initially, because if he did he would have to be buried in a traditional style, and not on unmarked ground in the forest. So this leads me to believe that the crying child fell into a coma after the bite, and William demanded that he be sent back to the house. We know that William says that he'll put the crying child back together, so I believe the crying child was sent back to the Afton's house while he was in his coma, and William would later experiment on his son to bring him back. Then this would lead to his death, and William wouldn't tell anyone of the crying child's death, and he would bury him privately in the woods. The final thing I want to bring up is that I believe that Junior's is a bar, and not the FNAF 2 pizzeria. The reason I think this is because there is a man outside Junior's telling us that we can't enter. This type of person is known as a bouncer. Bouncers are common at clubs and bars. This makes sense to me because bars are not allowed to serve you more alcohol if you appear to be heavily intoxicated, as it could become a serious health problem. And I also believe that Junior's used to be Fred Bear's family diner. The reason I think this is because in the floor plan and sister location, William's house is right next to Fredbear's. And in this minigame, William's house is right next to the bar. We all know that Fredbear's closed down after the bite of 83. And that would mean that there would be an abandoned building just sitting around. So I believe someone bought up the building and turned it into a bar. I also have more evidence to further prove that Junior's used to be Fredbear's. In the Silver Eyes novel, Charlie and John are driving to Fredbear's. Charlie says that it's a 30 minute drive. That could be considered a while for some people. The distance from Freddy's to Fredbear's is long, even while driving. This means the same thing for the games. It takes a while for William to go from Freddy's after killing Charlotte to the bar which once used to be Fredbear's. And keep in mind, William is speeding and it still takes him a while to finally get to the bar. And you gotta remember that if Michael was lured out to Freddy's, it would take him ages to get there on foot. If it's a 30 minute drive to go from Freddy's to the bar, then it must be at least an hour and a half, maybe even a two hour walk to go from the house to Freddy's. And I don't imagine that Michael would follow Fredbear all the way to Freddy's. It just seems completely illogical to me, since Michael has a bad experience with the animatronics with his brother being killed by one of them. 
In my theory video, I had a lot of people ask me why William was driving on the left side of the road instead of the right. And the answer I have for this is that this minigame is only a driving game in Pizzeria Simulator. It's just a game kids can play throughout the day. It's not supposed to represent anything. It's only a harmless game. I believe that Scott only added on later that night to the minigame to give us more answers to the lore of FNAF. And that's my take on Midnight Motorist. With that being said, I'm just gonna hand things back over to Floop Loops. Special thanks to Lightning Films for going more in depth on each little point. If you want to check out his video where he talks about it, it'll be linked in the description below. So that wraps up all the mysteries I'll be talking about in this video. There's still definitely more out there, so if you guys want a part 3, let me know in the comments below. And I swear to god, it won't take 5 months this time. Just before I end this video though, I want to say a special thanks to Johnny and Nightguard for joining this video, as well as all the members in this video. All channels will be linked in the description below, as well as all the sources that I used. But yeah, thank you guys so much for watching this video, and make sure to subscribe for more FNAF content. Bye.